It is my privilege to welcome you here to a celebration, a celebration of life well lived and a life that was very purposeful. Harlan Pollock is in heaven today, but he would smile and appreciate so much you being a part of this celebration where we're going to honor his Lord by talking about what he did through this man. Would you pray with me, please, Father? We come to this place knowing all of the promises that you've given us for times just like this. And we trust you with it now. And I pray that there would be such comfort in this room that there would be a sense of calmness, but also confidence. That as we go through this service and as we remember we just have an overwhelming um, desire to praise you. So, Lord, we look forward to this time together. We look forward to your promises being fulfilled, and we look forward to knowing your word for today. In Jesus' name, amen. There's uh, something special about getting to share music and particularly worship with someone. And, uh, and I got to do that with Harlan uh, at church on Sundays. And so I'm very privileged to be able to do it with you today as well. We shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed, and our spirit shall sorrow no more. Not a sigh for the blessing of rest in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore 
in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore and in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore Harland J. Pollock, a beloved husband, father, grandfather, and esteemed member of the community, passed away on March 20th, 2024, at the age of 87. He was born on January 29th, 1937, in Soldier, Kansas, to James Harold and Alma Francis Pollock. Harland lived a life characterized by dedication and loyalty. After graduating from Valley Springs High School in 1954, he embarked on an exceptional journey at the young age of 17 with Save a Stop, which later became known as McKesson and eventually Melbrook, where he retired at the age of 60. Over the span of 43 years, he committed himself to the company, rising through the ranks to serve as division manager in St. Louis and later as credit and collections manager in Harrison. His unwavering dedication culminated in his retirement on March 31, 1997, coinciding with the company's transition to Millbrook. Beyond his professional accomplishments, Harlan was a man of many passions. He was an avid fisherman, cherishing those tranquil times on the water for reflection, camaraderie and a chance to spend time with grandkids, teaching them the sport he so loved. He took immense pride in his family, delighting in every achievement and milestone of his children and grandchildren. Harlan and his beloved wife, Wilma, shared a zest for life and exploration. They roamed the country together, creating cherished memories and bringing back stories to, to share with their children and grandchildren. Additionally, Harlan appreciated a good game of horseshoes, so much so that his skills dissuaded others from partaking in the sport. He won numerous trophies at various fishing and horseshoe tournaments throughout his lifetime, but later donated his esteemed trophies to be reused for children participating in the Junior Olympics. Acts such as these exemplified his selflessness and community spirit. As Harlan loved to share with others, he was first and foremost a Christian and a member of First Baptist Church of Harrison, where he served as deacon and trustee. Harlan also served with Gideon's International, International for over 25 years, serving as church services chairman for the Harrison camp. He told his family, my life changed when I became a Gideon. He is preceded in death by his parents and two brothers, Melvin Glenn and Eddie Pollock. Harlan is survived by his wife of more than 66 years, Wilma Pollock. 
three daughters, Lisa Brightwell, Angie Fa Angela Fowler, and Peggy Harness, Olive Harrison. Two sisters, Norma Pollock of Harrison and Sue Dickerson of Jonesboro. Six grandchildren and five great grandchildren. troubled and only you could know the pain you weren't afraid to face the devil you were no stranger to the rain so go rest high Son, your work on earth is done. Go to heaven a shouting love for the Father and the Son. Oh, how we cried the day you us. We gathered round your grave to grieve. Wish I could see the angels' faces when they hear your sweet voice sing. So go Harlan Pollock was a man who didn't like to waste time. He uh, 
like to do what he wanted to with his time. And so I don't think God's wasting this time today. Um, in fact, he's already used it. Thank you, family, because Chris has learned songs he didn't know existed. And uh, so it's been a, um, a growth experience for him today. So <laughs> that's fun. Oh, my goodness. We get to celebrate a life that was so well lived among us. What is perfect? Come on. None of us are. But I'm telling you what, when he talked about having a bent toward the Lord, some things radically changed in his life. And we're going to get to share a little bit about that today. Let me give you a verse of scripture, though. The verse of scripture is found in um, John, and it's familiar to a lot of people. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. But let me just share with you that this is called uh, a memorial service. By definition, a memorial is a remembrance, a way of remembering. It's something that was created to prompt thoughts. And here's what we know in our hearts, however, that we are creating our own legacy, our own memorial every day that we live. And Harlan Pollock has done just that. He's created a legacy, a memorial, and I think as we talk a little bit more about it, you'll understand what he wanted you to see as that memorial. Now, let me just be completely transparent with you. There is no way in the world my words can do justice to Harlan Pollock's life. In fact, I told Jonesy as I was preparing for this today that, that uh, I felt like there is just so much I don't know what to leave out. But see, that's where you get to fill in the blanks. As you talk and as you share and as you have lunch together, and it's, you fill in all those blanks that Rob couldn't fit in or perhaps didn't know. His life, uh, well, let's just say that Harlan was a big man and he cast a big shadow. But that shadow had substance to it. And that's what I hope to convey to you today was a man of substance. Every life is like a prism, uh, this multi-sided object that you look into. And we have viewed his life from different perspectives, certainly mine as his pastor. But maybe for you as a friend or a work associate or maybe a fellow church member, a fishing buddy, uh, a relative, maybe a, a daughter, or um, a grandchild or great-grandchild, or Wilma, his wife. You know, the wonderful things about this is that whatever view you had, you got to see essentially the same thing. And that's positive. You know, in the last few weeks of his life, I kept thinking, wow, Lord, let me be like you, like he's being like you. You know, Harlan was a man of integrity. We knew that as a church. And nowadays that quality seems to be in short supply. So you remember, he was like a unicorn. And uh, those are the kind of people you want to find and, and um you see it and hope to see it again when you see somebody like him. You could trust him. The family said he was true to his word, and he was. He was a man of wisdom. Along with that integrity, his wisdom was um, seen by his church, and they believed it so much so that they made him a trustee of the church. Now, if you're not part of this church or a Baptist church, a trustee is the person, we have three in our church, that all of the major 
um, decisions uh, about the future life of the church, the real estate transactions, those kind of things. Those are the people that we go to for wisdom and direction. They were sages, so to speak. But we had to be able to trust them, trust that they cared for their church more than themselves. They looked after the affairs of the church and made sure that the church was doing the right thing in the right way. People trusted his leadership, whether it was in business or whether it was in the spiritual business. The family pointed out that he always made you feel secure. Uh, it was just his demeanor, his wisdom, his integrity. He made you feel secure. As one of you pointed out that he was there for the big issues, the things that happened that maybe you weren't expecting in life, and it had you reeling. He was the person that comfort and consoled and gave you confidence about taking the next step. He was the place for valued advice. You know, I have been blessed as pastor of this church to have some men, wise men, who always thought before they spoke, but when they spoke, they spoke truth and wisdom. Whether or not the pastor wanted to hear it, they loved me enough to tell me the truth. And that's what I appreciate about men like Harlan. And Harlan was a man of priorities, but you know that. His God and his family came first. He was, he was available, I've been told, to, um, he was consistently available to play a game with you, to shoot hoops with you, <laughs> to help in the garden. Wait a minute, let me clarify that. To get the girls to help in the garden, right? I think the phrase was, you don't help, you don't eat. And I wish I could do it like Harlan. You don't help, you don't eat. I can't, I, I am, I'm asking God to give me Harlan's voice. I just want that. Well, he was the kind of person that we all know that um, was the one kind of dad or granddad or friends or coworker that you'd like to claim is yours. The significance of a life like that is very valued valuable but it's the next step that makes it supernatural because he was a man of faith and I think if Harland had anything to do with his service today that's what he'd want us to get to and talk about this faith oh not his the faith that God puts in us sometimes he loved his family so much that he was willing listen willing to live the example of that faith that he held and wants you to embrace also. Uh, Wilma gave me an example that many years ago, his first grandchild was five or six years old and Harlan had gotten a habit of using a form of tobacco. And Harlan noticed that his five or six year old grandchild was watching him and studying him one day as he went about this process. And he said it bothered him so much that he stopped immediately that day and never picked it up. Why? Because he wondered what kind of an example am I setting for my grandchildren? That is wholehearted love. Nothing left in the tank. I'm going to give you everything I have. Anything for the family and anything for the Lord. When he was in the hospital his last week and he knew his body was failing, the family knew his body was failing, he made sure that they knew several things. And one of those things that he was adamant about was to make sure that you go to the house and get his tithe checks and turn them in. All right. <laughs> now listen. When, when you're that precise about wanting to show your family your faith and to do things as they ought to be done, wow, 
How can we lose a man in this church like that? Well, it's because he hopes that he modeled it in such a way that other people can follow him and not live like him, live like Jesus. And if it happens to resemble Harlan, that's okay. But he would love for you to know that. So let's talk about that faith and what it meant to Harlan and what it can mean to you. The best thing I can do is illustrate it. No, the best thing I can do is let Harlan illustrate it to you. One of my visits, I think, well, it was on a Thursday. You and I were in the room, and we really thought the Lord was taking him home. There were some complications. We didn't understand what it was. All we knew is we were ushered out, and we went to a consultation room, and, and we thought, this is it. This, this, they're going to come tell us that he's gone to heaven. But he didn't. In fact, they took, to, um, uh, took him down to the cath lab to do another procedure and brought him back to the room. But, but at this point, the family knew, he knew that he couldn't have the surgery that he wanted to have. His kidneys were failing, and he didn't want to live like that. And they just knew what God's path was. And he did too. He chose to make the most of whatever time he had left. You know, we say, do you want to know when you're going to die? Well, most of us would say, well, no. But if you did, you'd make the best use of your time. And that's exactly what Harlan Pollock did. But what he did was amazing. One night, they were called to the hospital at midnight because they said, his body is failing, you need to come. And they came up there, and they, the girls and mom were crying, and they got in the room, and, and Harlan saw them and said, come here. And they thought that, oh, he wants us to pray for him. He said, hold my hands, I want to pray for you. Well, when my son Brian said, I'm not going to make it through this, and I might not. So he said, I want to pray for you. Let me pray for you. And he had a sweet prayer for every one of the girls and ended by saying, and Wilma. So he made sure that they had comfort. That's just who he was. Oh. But that's not all the story. My goodness. And by the way, let me just brag on this family and how the Lord used them in my life. I've been around the block a while. I've got a stack of funerals that big in my office. And, um, and I just want you to know that what I experienced with this family during this time, it may not have been unique. It's just that God had me see it intentionally for this. When I was in the room with these three daughters and this beautiful wife, there was a quiet serenity and an overt confidence that can only come from God. Where they said, yes, he's, he's going to be leaving. Yes, he's going to heaven. And, and they said, yes, we're going to miss him. But we don't have to grieve like those who have no hope. Wow. But that's not the best part of the story. Harlan was under medication. His body had gone through a lot. So he was under some medication to keep him comfortable. But one night in the midst of that medication, the night nurse came in. And the night nurse, I'm not going to call his name, but the night nurse came in and Harlan woke up and called him by name and said, do you know how to go to heaven? And the family said his voice was crystal clear. It was if, as if he was completely healed and well. He was able not to slur his words as the medication was causing. He spoke directly and clearly to this young man 
and said, do you know how to go to heaven? And the young man said, oh, I'm the wrong one to be asking that question. And he said, well, let me share with you the last verse we think that he ever shared was John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And he spoke to that young man for 20 minutes about becoming a Christian. Oh, and then when the chaplain came by, he told the chaplain, you make sure you follow up on this. The day Harlan passed away, I had gone up to visit, to see the family, and uh, we were talking about this wonderful testimony, and I said, well, you know, I have a Gideon Bible in the car down there to give away. Would you like to have that? Oh, yes, and we're going to sign it over to this nurse from Harlan. You know, as he made his way to heaven, he got to speak to his children and grandchildren and, and told them how proud he was of them. But he always ended the conversation by saying, now, stay in church. Stay in church. Because he knew that the best things in life aren't out there. They're in here. And if you take care of that, you will, beyond a shadow of a doubt, have a life that you can be proud of. Easy? Probably not. But one that you can look back as people look at your life as that prism and they begin to see something in you that they want in themselves. Now think about it. If the Lord lets you know that you've got a few hours to live, how are you going to spend it? Harlan Pollock did it by trying to get somebody to go with him eventually, to go with him to heaven. I think for us, we have to understand that God's timing is absolutely perfect. We don't understand it every time, but we do know him, and his timing is perfect. And what you have to understand is that Harlan died on the day that God planned it for him. Because there's a testimony that needed to be shared today because you're here. A long time ago, God prompted me to realize that sometimes I take my children home with me because there's somebody that's going to be in that service and hear the gospel that could not have come at any other day except this one. And the preacher is going to get to share the message, share the testimony, share how to go to heaven on that day day so you see harlan is not only witnessing to a nurse that served him and served him well he is witnessing to you today do you know how to go to heaven well, all you have to do is realize that we have sin and sin keeps us from a holy god but God loves you so much that he sent, remember the verse, sent his only son to die for your sin, to pay for your sin. And all you have to do is reach out and accept what Jesus Christ has done for you. And then you too can go to heaven when you die. Oh, but there's more. It's not only just that pie in the sky by and by. It is the opportunity to have a life on purpose right now that goes from the natural to the supernatural in the blink of an eye. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life. I meant right now. And they can have it more abundantly. Harlan Pollock believed that. Harlan Pollock died believing that. And Harlan Pollock lives today because he believed that. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes, please? I'm going to ask you a question right now, and we'll be leaving this place in just a few minutes. And I promise you I'm not going to single you out, but if you would just close your eyes for just a moment. 
if you would like to go to heaven when you die, then just like Harlan, you pray a simple prayer. It's not magic. It's just a conversation with God. It's a transaction with him where you give everything you are to him and he gives everything he is to you. And that little prayer goes like this, and you can pray it in your own mind right now. Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner, and I need somebody to save me. Jesus, I believe you. I believe you died for me and rose from the grave. I believe that you can forgive my sins. Jesus, come into my life. Make me who you want me to be. God, thank you for saving me. With no one looking around, if you've this day, this hour, prayed that prayer and meant it from the bottom of your heart, would you do something to show courage? Would you just lift your hand up and just hold it for a second, just so I can see it. Nobody else is looking around. If you prayed that prayer, would you just lift your hand for just one moment? And then put it back down. All right, look this way. Look this way. You know, the wonderful thing about being together like this is we get to experience. We get to experience what God is going to do in a service like this and then afterwards. The last thing I want to share with the family is you are, you are a wonderful family. Love each other. Tell the stories. Laugh until you cry. Cry until you laugh. Because he would want that for you. And we will all miss him. And miss the fish fries. And, but we will see him again. We will. May I pray for us before we go. Father, I want to thank you for this time. And for those who have, for the very first time, accepted you as savior during this service today lord i pray that they would tell somebody about what they did so they can get help to grow as a believer and know what it means now that everything has changed their direction and their destiny lord i pray that you would just honor this legacy help this family to be able to live it as as harlan has made the path clear let them all just dedicate themselves to you in the days ahead. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful celebration of this life that trusted you. And now as we sing, Father, let us sing with everything that's in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chris? This is the hymnal in front of you. If you would pull it out, please, and turn to... Number 334. And when you get there, or before you get there, go ahead and stand with us. And uh, we're going to sing Blessed Assurance that only He can give. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Praising my Savior all the day.
song. 